much better than earlier. I can turn it up a little bit so people can hear. How's it in the back? Is it good? Great. Well, I'm Susan LaPerla, and on behalf of the library, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you for this afternoon's program, which we are so pleased to present with the United Nations Committee of New Canaan. The UN Committee and the library have a long history of presenting timely, thought-provoking, and interesting programs on a variety of global issues related to the work of the UN, and today's is no exception. I would like to say also that the UN Committee has just announced the speaker for the 8th Annual Anita Houston Lecture. It's going to take place on November 9th here, 4 o'clock, and it's Daniel Esty, who is a Yale professor and a former advisor or a member of um, an advisory committee for the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection, and his topic is going to be um, climate change. So I invite you all to attend that interesting lecture as well. I want to thank you for your ongoing show of support for these fine programs with your attendance and to let you know that the donations collected today will benefit both the library and the work of the UN Committee. So thank you for supporting us in these endeavors. And also want to give a shout out to Elm Street Books, who's also a partner for many great library programs, and they're here today to sell Scott's book, and he'll be available to sign books after the program. So welcome and enjoy, and I'd like to turn it over to Shakeba Bennett, the co-chair of the United Nations Committee of New Canaan, who will introduce Scott. Thank you so much, Susan, and thank you to all of you for being here, and to the library for many years of being our great partner, and to Elm Street Books. Um, Scott Anderson is an American journalist, novelist, and a veteran war correspondent. His books include, his works include Triage, Moonlight Hotel, The Man Who Tried to Save the World, Inside the League, and War Zones. He has written numerous, he has written for numerous publications, including the New York Times Magazine, GQ, Esquire, Man's, uh, Men's Journal, and Vanity Fair. His latest book, which is available for all of you after uh, the lecture to get signed and maybe photograph with Mr. Anderson. His latest book, Lawrence in Arabia, was on the short list for 2013 National Book Critics Circle Award. It is with pleasure to introduce Scott Anderson. Thanks very much. Uh, th thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm trying to remember if I've, I've ever been to New Cane before, and uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure I have, but it seems like a nice town. <laughs> um, so I was, I was going to start by just talking a little bit about how I came to write this book. Um, I've been, uh, I, I've been a, a, a journalist uh, and, and mostly covering war uh, for about the past 25 years. And if you cover war in the modern era, it, it invariably you end up spending a lot of time in the Middle East. Um, and it, over my years in the Middle East, what I, uh, what I discovered was that every time I had a, a detailed conversation with somebody, and it didn't matter their, their political or sectarian uh, persuasion, invariably people would, would trace the roots of the problems in the region today back to the, the, the peace that was imposed upon them 100 years ago at the, at the end of World War I. Um, so I, I had a, I, I, it was always in the back of my mind that I would, I'd like to, to, to get off the, the front lines for a while to, uh, uh, to work on a book, and I was fascinated by that period of history. Um, probably also uh, exacerbated by the fact that I, I, I had a small child and, and wanted to stop going to live war zones. Um, and so about five years ago, I, I got thinking, six years ago now, I got, got thinking that I would like to do a book about this period of history. And what, what certainly um, further piqued my interest in it is that I knew that a person who was very important at the core of that history was uh, T.E. Lawrence, better known as Lawrence of Arabia. I had seen the, the movie, the David Lane movie, w as a kid, and had been uh, always been fascinated by Lawrence's story. Um, but when I decided to write a book about Lawrence, the, the, f the first obstacle that, that uh, I faced with was uh, what to say that was in any way new. There have been 
upwards of 70, I think upwards of 80 now, biographies done on T.E. Lawrence over the years. Um, and I didn't want to just do a, a, a distilling of what, of what everybody else had done. And I kind of came up with the answer of how to approach it in a new way by, by kind of going back to what I think is the core riddle of Lawrence's life, which I essentially is how did he do it? How did a painfully shy, five foot four, tw a 28 year old Oxford scholar, how did that guy go off to Arabia and become a battlefield commander for an Arab rebel army? And not just, a re and not just an Arab rebel army, but an Arab Muslim army. And it occurred to me that part, well, part of the answer, of course, is, 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 is a touch of genius. And a man uh, who, who finds himself at, at this unique, uh, an environment that he's uniquely suited to. But part of it also, it's almost anticlimactic, uh, is that no one was really paying that much attention. The, the, the war in Arabia uh, was in the midst of World War, w World war I. And certainly for the British, the, the vast majority of their blood and treasure was being expended on the Western Front. So. If this, ra if this rather eccentric uh, young guy could go off to Arabia and cause problems for the for the Ottoman, the, the Ottomans who were allied with the, the Germans in World War One, uh, then then go to it. And so Lawrence had this tremendous freedom of movement uh, and, and and self initiative that he he wouldn't have had in any other uh, theater of the war. And when it occurred to me th th that about Lawrence, I thought, well, if that was true about the British, who are by far the biggest Im imperial players in the region, um, then it must have been true about the other warring factions. So kind of the, from the starting point of Lawrence, I started to look around and found this other cast of characters. And, and um, so the book is both about Lawrence, but also about three of his contemporaries. They're uh, a, a German spy who very much like Lawrence was an Oriental scholar. He was a, he was a master linguist. And uh, during the war, he became the head of uh, German counterintelligence in the Middle East. Um, very, very mysterious and kind of creepy guy named Kurt Prufer. Uh, William Yale, who was of the Yale family, the, um, the founder of Yale University, a fallen aristocrat, a, f a fallen Yankee blue blood. Uh, who ended up going off just before World War I started, going off to the Middle East to prospect for oil, for Standard Oil, um, and ended up, because the Americans didn't come into the war until 1917, he ended up staying in the Turkish-occupied uh, Jerusalem in Palestine uh, until 1917. He then became, and he had to leave because the Americans came into the war, he became uh, the only American field intelligence officer in the entire Middle East during World War I. Uh, he came back to the States, he was hired on by the State Department and sent back. And he had lots of dealings with Lawrence uh, over the years. And then the, the other character is um, a man named Aaron Aronson, who was a Jewish settler, uh, ori originally from Romania. His family had settled in Palestine. Uh, he was a, uh, probably, the, probably the leading agronomist, agricultural scientist in the Middle East uh, of the time. And at the beginning of the war, he was, he was very loyal to the Ottomans that it had given his family a uh, safe haven from the pogroms in Eastern Europe. Um, but at a certain point, he realized if it, th there was going to be any future for Jewish settlement in Palestine, that he was on the wrong side. And he set up a very elaborate uh, spy ring made up of Jewish settlers uh, funneling military secrets to the British. Um, so he was a fascinating character. Um, but, but in the book, Lawrence is still very much at center stage. And, and there's, uh, there's a couple of really compelling reasons to do that. Um, one being that the, the British were by far the, the, they were the vehicles of the war. They, they were the prime movers of the war and they were the, the prime uh, creators of the peace afterwards. And Lawrence was intimately connected with both those things. Um, so he's, he's kind of, a, that's, that's the reason he's at center stage. Um, Lawrence was, a, a an incredibly enigmatic and inscrutable figure. And, that, and I think part of the enduring attraction of him almost 100 years later is, is because he was so uh, inscrutable. And I'm just going to, I'm only going to read two small sections today. I'm, and I was going to start with just the way I start the book. Um, and it gives, you, it gives you at least a sense of the mystery of Lawrence. On the morning of October 30th, 1918, Colonel Thomas Edward Lawrence received a summons to Buckingham Palace. The King had requested his presence. The collective mood in London that day was euphoric. For the past four years and three months, Great Britain and much of the rest of the world 
had been consumed by the bloodiest conflict in recorded history, one that had claimed the lives of some 16 million people across three continents. Now, with a speed that scarcely could have been imagined mere weeks earlier, it was all coming to an end. On that same morning of October 30th, one of Great Britain's three principal foes, the Ottoman Empire, was accepting peace terms, and the remaining two, Germany and Austro-Hungary, would, would shortly follow suit. Colonel Lawrence's contribution to that war effort had been in its Middle Eastern theater, and he too was caught quite off guard by its rapid close. At the beginning of that month, he had still been in the field assisting in the capture of Damascus, an event that heralded the collapse of the Ottoman army. Back in England for less than a week, he was already consulting with those senior British statesmen and generals tasked with mapping out the post-war borders of the Middle East, a once fanciful endeavor that had now become quite urgent. Lawrence was apparently under the impression that, uh, that his audience with King George V that morning was to discuss those ongoing deliberations. He was mistaken. Once at the palace, the 30-year-old colonel was ushered into a ballroom where, flanked by a half dozen dignitaries and a coterie of costumed courtiers, the king and queen soon entered. A low cushion stool had been placed just before the king's raised dais, while to the monarch's Im immediate right, the Lord, Ch the Lord Chamberlain held a velvet pillow on which an array of medals rested. After introductions were made, George V fixed his guest with a smile and said, I have some presents for you. As a student of British history, Colonel Lawrence knew precisely what was about to occur. The pedestal was an investiture stool upon which he was to kneel as the king performed the elaborate centuries-old ceremony that would make him a knight of the order of the, of the British Empire. It was a moment T.E. Lawrence had long dreamed of. As a boy, he was obsessed with medieval history and the tales of King Arthur's court, and his greatest ambition, he once wrote, was to be knighted by the age of 30. On that morning, his youthful aspiration was about to occur, was about to be fulfilled. A couple of details added to the honor. Over the past four years, King George had given out so many commendations and medals to his nation's soldiers that even knighthoods were now generally bestowed en masse. In, that, in the autumn of 1918, a private investiture like Lawrence's was practically unheard of. Also unusual was the presence of Queen Mary. She normally eschewed these sorts of ceremonies, but she had been so stirred by the accounts of T.E. Lawrence's wartime deeds as to make an exception in his case. <coughs> Except Lawrence didn't kneel. Instead, just as the ceremony got underway, he quietly informed the king that he was refusing the honor. There followed a moment of confusion. Over the 900-year history of the monarchy, the refusal of knighthood was such an extraordinary event that there was simply no protocol for how to handle it. Eventually, King George returned to the Lord Chamberlain's pillow the medal he had been awkwardly holding, and under the baleful gaze of a furious Queen Mary, Colonel Lawrence turned and walked away. Um, so that's sort of the way, the way I open the book, and then you've got to read the next 500 pages to find out, <laughs> find out why he did it. Um, but Lawrence, um, he, so who was, who was T.E. Lawrence? He was from an upper middle class family. Um, and in fact, he, he should have, well, the, fir the first part of the mystery of Lawrence is that his surname actually wasn't Lawrence at all, at all or it, it should have been Chapman. His father was a member of the Anglo-Irish aristocracy who um, uh, had, had married a, a, another a, a, an aristocratic woman, had four daughters, um, and then started an affair with the governess to his, to his young daughters. And when his wife found out, um, at that point, they, they'd already had one child out of wedlock or, or in, the, in, the, in the affair, uh, refused to give her husband uh, a, a divorce. And this is, this is the Victorian era. So uh, Thomas Chapman had the choice of, of either packing the governess off to Scotland as a stipend for the, for the child, um, which is what most people did in those circumstances, or if he left, uh, if he, if he left his wife and joined uh, and, and went off with the governess, he, ha he was a baronet, he, had to, he, had, he would have to renounce his title, he would re renounce his family's estate in Ireland, uh, and that's what he did. Uh, he, he, he gave up his baronetcy, and he assumed the name of Lawrence. And throughout T. Lawrence, he was the, he was the second of, of five boys. Throughout his childhood, um, the family lived this fugitive existence. The, the, the parents, and especially the father, was, was mortally terrified 
of someday crossing paths with someone who knew him from his, from his former life. And this was a, a secret that, that uh, actually the only one who ever figured out the secrets to a degree was, was T.E. Lawrence himself. Um, but it, it says something about what was going on in this family that once he figured out the secret, and he was about uh, 11, apparently when he figured it out, um, never brought it up with his parents and never even told any of his brothers and sisters, uh, his brothers. Um, so it was a secret he kept to himself. Um, when, when Lawrence was uh, eight years old, the family had already moved six times. Th by the time he was eight years old, they finally ended up in Oxford. The father, uh, he'd gone to Eton and Oxford, and he wanted his boys to have an Oxford education. Um, Lawrence, uh, as a young man, it, it really is a, is a it started by about the age of 12 or 13. Uh, he was painfully shy. Um, and had this had this streak in him that almost bordered on uh, of of such um, such this iron will to to test the limits of his endurance and his strength that it almost bordered on it, in fact it probably was uh, masochism. Uh, he would go days without sleeping or or um, eating or or even drinking water. He was he had he stopped growing. He was he he was only five foot four. His uh, all of his other brothers be, uh, grew much taller than him. Um, and he would ride a bicycle for for 70, 80, he would ride a bicycle to, to the point where he would just be absolutely exhausted. Um, and where this maybe first took somewhat in a more healthier form is um, when he was, he was admitted to the University of Oxford and he decided when he was 20 that he was, uh, he was obsessed with the Crusaders and he decided that he was going to go to Syria and tour the, uh, the Crusader castles of Syria. But in typical Lawrence fashion, he wasn't, he wasn't just going to see some of them, he was gonna go to all of them and he was gonna walk. And he was gonna do it in the summer, when, during a summer recess at Oxford. Um, and everyone, everyone said he was mad to do this, um, but, it, but he did it and he walked 1,200 miles um, across Syria in, in 1912. And going into areas of Syria where they had never seen a Westerner before and, uh, and really remote areas, and this waif, this five foot four waif wanders into their village. Um, <laughs> they, they think it's a, like a lost 14 year old boy. And so wherever he went, he was taken care of. Uh, in, in true Ar uh, Arab tradition of hospitality, he was, he was uh, uh, protected. And to the point where at one point the local Turkish governor uh, insisted that he, 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 uh, he get on a, on a horse or a camel to, to continue his journey and, and Lawrence refused. So he sent a troop of cavalry just to guard Lawrence going across the desert. And there's this great scene in his, one of his letters home where he talks about walking across this desert with this, this troop of cavalry uh, trailing along behind him. Um, so uh, w when after, after the trip, he, he came back to Oxford, he got his degree. Um, he learned that uh, there was going to be this British museum sponsored archeological dig in Northern Syria. And he talked his way onto this dig. He was one of only two Westerners uh, to to go out, and he spent the next four years of his life uh, in this uh, this place right now. It's a Hittite ruin. It's right on the border of Turkey and and Syria. Uh, and L Lawrence would later call it the the happiest days of his life. Um, he even more than studying the archaeology, he became fascinated by Arab society and and how this the, how the culture worked. And he studied the clan and tribal structure uh, that existed in that part of of uh, Syria. Um, and was, was, again, kind of a, uh, unlike any Westerner, a, a, a local in that area probably ever would have encountered, uh, uh, took, taking a genuine interest uh, in their culture. Uh, he, would invite him, he would invite himself into, into this, the, the workers, the local workers working on the archaeological site, their homes, and to meet their families. And, and he, would, he drew, drew very complicated family trees of, of the descendants going back in, in generations. And because of his masochistic streak, um, uh, certainly in that part of, of, of Syria, the, to the degree that uh, the locals had had any uh, contact with Westerners, they thought of them as, as really soft and weak. Um, and yet Lawrence was as tough as they were. He could work all day in 110 degree heat. Um, he could ride a camel for days, um, which is an extre extremely painful thing to do. So they really came, kind of came to see him as, as, as kind of um, uh, you know, brethren. Uh, which would stand him in very good stead when the, when the war came along. So Lawrence had 
planned to just stay at uh, this, this place is called Carchemish. Kar 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 uh, he was going to stay on there indefinitely. Uh, it was it ended with the outbreak of World War One in 1914. He happened to be back in England uh, at the time of the outbreak of the war in the, in the summer, and for a few months he um, he it, 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 and it was agonizing for him. He couldn't join the war. He was too short. He was uh, I keep going back to his height, but it, it, there was it was such a rush of volunteers to join the British Army at the outbreak of World War One that they raised the height limit to I, be, I believe to five five or five six, and so Lawrence was too short. Um, but when the Turks came into the war, they, they didn't come into the war, uh, they came into the war uh, a few months after the, the European outbreak, and they joined with uh, Germany and Austria, Hungary. Uh, Lawrence was uh, inducted into the military, and I'll, I'll t there's a great story of, of how he got inducted in the military. He was, he was actually working as a civilian in the mapping room of the British uh, Army headquarters in London, um, and a general came in. Uh, who was about to be dispatched to the Western Front, and, and so he was going to get a, a briefing on the latest aerial maps of the, of the battle zone that he was being sent to. And the only person there to brief him was Lawrence. Um, and the general was so incensed that he, it, that he was being briefed by a civilian. He said, he said uh, damn it, I want, I, want to, I want to be briefed by an officer. So they sent Lawrence out to the Army Navy store to buy a second <laughs> lieutenant's uniform, <laughs> and then retroactively made him a second lieutenant. So that's how Lawrence <laughs> actually joined the military. He never had one day of military training. Um, so when the war starts, he's sent out to Cairo to work with the military intelligence unit in Cairo, and he spends the next two years basically sitting behind a desk. Um, the the British Army, uh, they, the, Br the British control Egypt, and they're using Egypt as the as the, the main base to wage war against the Turks, and it, and they're, they're also very intent on do on doing these frontal assaults, uh, fighting the war the same futile war the feudal way they've been fighting it on the Western Front, and Lawrence and the other people in the military intelligence unit have this whole idea of of enlisting the aid of local Arab tribes who want to break away from, from the Ottoman Turks to, to begin with. And for two years, they're ignored. Um, but finally, the Arab Revolt starts in the summer of 1916. And um, through this just an amazingly uh, flukish uh, occurrence, uh, about four months after the Arab Revolt had started, and it immediately, immediately kind of foundered. It, and it started in Western Arabia, the Western Arabian Peninsula. Uh, Lawrence went out and... Um, in the space of 10 days managed to to not only meet the four, it, the, the, re, the revolt was started by uh, Amir Hussein. Um, he was the king, he became the king of Hejaz, which is a whole region of West Central Arabia. And so the battlefield commanders were his four sons. Um, and so in the space of this one 10 day trip out there, and he, he basically went just to accompany uh, a friend who actually had an official mission in Hejaz, and, and, but Lawrence didn't have any. He'd taken a leave of absence from his desk job. Uh, he met all four of the sons and managed to inculcate his way into the Arab revolt. And when he got back to Cairo, he was at first sent over uh, as a temporary liaison, and then it became permanent. And the main, the main person he worked with was uh, Faisal, who was King Hussein's, one of King Hussein's sons, but he was the main battlefield commander of, of the Arab rebels. Um, and that became the that became the beginning. If, if, if those of you who've seen the movie, Faisal is is a very important figure. I, I, I try to remember who plays Faisal at the moment. Um, Alec, Alec Guinness. That's right. Um, and they became very. And because Lawrence spoke Arabic, he and he donned Arab dress. He became Faisal's most trusted advisor, and he'd sit up, he would sit in on tribal uh, meetings and 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 w where battlefield strategy was decided. But while Lawrence was doing this, he 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 harbored a very guilty secret. Um, in in getting the Arabs, to, in getting Hussein to lead the Arab revolt, the ba the British had promised uh, Hussein uh, independence of virtually the entire Arab world, uh, with uh, with a couple of small areas, an area up kind of in where where Lebanon is today, uh, which which the French insisted on having and um, an area of southern Iraq where the British had discovered oil, so they wanted to keep that. But virtually everything else that you think of as the Middle East w uh, was promised to Hussein, uh, everything below Turkey essentially, uh, as, as a future Arab independent nation. Um, 
five months after doing that, the British had turned around and entered a secret deal with the French called the Sykes-Picot Treaty, where the very same places that, that they had promised to the Arabs were now going to be carved up between the British and the French, that the, the future Arab uh, nation was going to be relegated to the wastelands of the Arabian Peninsula. This is before oil had been discovered in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, but virtually anything of uh, any anything of, of, of economic uh, or political value uh, was going to be it was going to be taken up by the British and the French. So any any almost any city you can think of of Damascus, uh, Jerusalem, um, all of that was going to the British and the French. And of course they they n they neglected to inform Hussein <laughs> about this secret deal. Uh, but because of Lawrence's position with military intelligence in Cairo, he w he was aware of both of these, of both of these agreements. Um, and the longer he spent in the field, uh, um, fighting with the Arab rebels, and 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 getting tribes, uh, getting tribes to enlist and and to fight and to die for a cause that he knew, that the overwhelming odds were that they were going to be betrayed in the end. Uh, it caused it, it caused a tremendous moral crisis for him. And in, in his book Seven Pillars, he talked about how he felt a, a fraud and a charlatan. Um, and he ends up he ends up telling Faisal about the existence of the Sykes Picot Treaty, uh, and and now not even technically uh, committing treason in the process. He's a, he's a sitting he's a, he's a standing British Army officer, and you know to 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 Im inform a third party of a, of a secret treaty in, in time of war, it, it doesn't get much more treasonous than, than that. Um, <laughs> but he, he, uh, he did it, on, on one hand he did it um, because he wanted Faisal to understand, he, and he said to Faisal, do not trust in the promises of, of my government. You know, if you want, and so Syria is the cultural and political heart of, of, of the Arab world. If you want Syria, um, you're going to have to fight for it, and 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 don't trust what my government tells you. I think the other th the other mo motivation for Lawrence too was because he knew the Arab w world so well, and he saw that th that th this imperial design that the British and French had on the region was going to end in a disaster for for Britain itself. So I think in a, in a roundabout way, he is, I, I think his own justification was that he was actually being a, 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 a patriot to to the, to the British of trying to warn them off or, or trying to subvert this this imperial plan that was going to end in, in disaster. Um, as the war extended, um, it, it, and Lawrence was in one battle after another, and he 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 became obsessed with this idea that if somehow he could get the Arab rebels to Damascus, the capital of, of Syria, uh, and really the, the, the capital of the Arab world at that time, um, that if, if they could physically get there before the British army, then they could, they could, steal, they, they could steal Damascus for the Arabs and, and, and deny it to the, um, it, it was promised to the French, but it, and, and take it away from the, uh, the French. So he became very obsessed with this idea that they had to get, the, 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 the Arabs had to get to Damascus first. So in the in the later days, uh, last few weeks of the war, in the summer of 1918, uh, while the British army was moving up the west coast of Palestine, um, uh, Lawrence and the uh, the Arab rebels were moving along the kind of the inland desert, and uh, and both sort of converging on Damascus as the as the Turks were fleeing and uh, uh, they'd really been routed out of out of Palestine. Um, but meanwhile, I think Lawrence was kind of losing his mind too. Um, he he was uh, he a lot, and a lot of it was this uh, this th thing of feeling that he was he was uh, he was betraying the people he was he was with. And so, in one battle after another, he took these these uh, just suicidal risks. I mean, it really did seem that on some level he was just trying to get himself killed. And um, in the final push towards the Damascus. Uh, they had come through a village that the retreating Turks uh, had, they, they had killed a lot of villagers uh, in, in this village. And so Lawrence ordered, um, uh, ordered his men, as the, there's a column of 4,000 Turks and German uh, advisors that are fleeing on, in, on the direction of Damascus. And he tells, he tells the men not to take any prisoners. And so through this long afternoon, uh, the, the, the Arabs, the fighters, you know, one after another, they kind of carve up this column and, and kill them. 
But in the afternoon, uh, Lawrence is coming back towards his headquarters, and he he comes across this this one unit of Arab rebels who hadn't gotten the hadn't received a no quarter order, and they've taken three hundred uh, Turks and Germans prisoner, and they're the prisoners are just sitting on the side of the road, and um, Lawrence orders them uh, machine guns, and he he describes it in his in his book Seven Pillars and. Uh, he described it in his, in his uh, official battlefield report. Um, he, he says, uh, I, I turned the Hotchkiss, a Hotchkiss being a, a type of machine gun, I turned the Hotchkiss on them and made an end of them. Um, three weeks after that, so th that they did get to Damascus. Uh, uh, Lawrence tries to set up a provisional Arab government uh, in Faisal's name. The main British general shows up t uh, two days later, and there's this this kind of amazing scene in this hotel in Damascus where Faisal and Lawrence and Allenby, the, the British general, um, and two other British officers go into this room and there's no record, there's no record was kept of it. But basically what happened was uh, Lawrence said, I'm, I'm claiming Damascus for, for the Arab nation and, and Allenby said, no, it's going to the French, you know that. And Faisal left the room and Lawrence, Lawrence asked to st stay back to talk to uh, Allenby, and he said, I want to be relieved of my command. And th the war is still going on at this point. This, um, this is early October of 1918, and, and Allenby first at first says, uh, no, you, you're, you're a British officer. You can't just decide <laughs> in, in a wartime that you're, you're going home. And Lawrence has said, well, I'm, I refuse to serve under the French. And so Allenby actually relented, and the next morning uh, Lawrence left Damascus, never to return, never, never came. He had used Damascus as a battle cry for two years. He would never, he would never go back to Damascus. He came back to London, which kind of takes to the to the to the the, the uh, opening scene of the knighthood uh, <laughs> that happened. So in, in a three week period, w it, Lawrence went in the field from machine gunning prisoners to three weeks later, uh, the king is trying to trying to give him a knighthood um, and refuses. Um, What Lawrence did, uh, and the war ended very quickly after that, uh, he went to the Paris Peace Conference as a, the liaison to Faisal. Faisal went also. Um, and he was trying to represent uh, Arab interests. And he was, he had, uh, Lawrence was already becoming very famous. He was, um, and you know, he, was, he was certainly one of the most dashing figures at, at, the, at the Paris Peace Conference. Um, but the same government that w had tried to knight him and, and uh, that had made him a, uh, a lieutenant colonel in, in just two years and, and, was, and was really s sort of holding him out as, as this, this matinee idol, um, increasingly saw him as the enemy within because he wouldn't, dis he wouldn't go along with the British and French partition of the Middle East. And he, was, he, was, he had become the fly in the ointment of, of this, this imperial peace being decided on. Uh, and he wouldn't let go of the the Arab cause. So it, it ended up he was uh, sent uh, uh, after about six months um, banned from from attending the Paris Peace Conference and banned because he was still a sitting in the, he was still a s standing officer, banned from having any more contact with with Faisal. And it, 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 there's w there's one little it, it kind of amazing moment at the Paris Peace Conference where Woodrow Wilson. Who's come in with this idea that you know the rights of, of small he call them small people small nations would be respected and this whole idea of self determination uh, and a, and an anti imperialist uh, he comes up with this and the, the British and the French are are, are uh, arguing over what happens in the Middle East and Lawrence actually sits with President Wilson and says this has been promised to the Arabs so Wilson orders a commission uh, to be sent out to the Middle East um, to find out what the actual people want, the, 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 the locals in, in the region. And the American character in the book, William Yale, actually goes, he was part of this, it was called the King Crane Commission. So they go out for, they go out for three months uh, to the Middle East and wherever they go, and they, ha they have the basically town hall meetings all through Syria and, and present day Lebanon and Palestine. Um, everywhere they go, everyone wants, the first thing they want is independence. If they can't have independence, they want an American mandate. They want an American protectorship, uh, and, if, and what what none of them want is uh, British uh, British control, and they certainly don't want French control. Um, 
but it's it's unanimous, and uh, you know all, every every ethnic group, every every religious group wants the same thing. So the the King Train Commission comes back to Paris uh, with this with this report of what the people actually want. It's now an embarrassment to the American government because Wilson is is not going to stand up to the British and French over the Middle East. So the King Train report gets buried, gets it, it locked in a in a safe for the next three years. No one sees it. <laughs> for And then finally the New York Times leaked it in 1922 or 1923. Uh, but it just disappeared. Um, so Lawrence, um, much as Lawrence had warned, um, the, 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 the partition of the, of the Middle East between the, the French and the, and the British goes ahead. And just as Lawrence had warned, wi within months, we're talking 1919, 1920, the whole place blows up, and there is revolt all the way from from uh, French-controlled Algeria, all the way to British-controlled Iraq. The entire region goes up in flames. Um, uh, it's it's such a disaster that that even the British imperialists think, okay, we're going to have to make some modifications. So uh, they appoint Winston Churchill a, as colonial secretary to kind of draw new borders and kind of come up with something that's a little more equitable for for the locals. Uh, he, the first person he turns to is T.E. Lawrence, and he and he forces T.E. Lawrence at this point doesn't want to have anything to do with, with this government. Um, he kind of forces T.E. Lawrence to join uh, s um, s a thing called the Cairo Conference in 1920, um, where he and Gertrude Bell and Winston Churchill and two or three others basically redraw the map of of the Middle East, and they create Jordan. The, they create the nation of Jordan, um, change the borders in Iraq. Um, so it, it created a short-term peace, um, but I, and I'll t I'll t I'll we can talk a, a bit later about the long-term consequences of it. Um, in 1920, it, it, when, when he joined with Churchill uh, in for the, the Cairo Conference, Lawrence um, said, I'll give you one year. I'm, I'm only going to work uh, for one year. And um, at the end of the year, Lawrence changed his name to, he had already done this once before, he had changed his name to uh, T.E. Shaw, legally changed his name, and uh, rejoined the, uh, the British military, the RAF, as a private. And he insisted on going in as a private. Um, Lawrence at this point was, really was the closest thing to, to a, 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 a matinee idol war hero that there was. Um, he would be recognized on the streets. He'd become very reclusive because he would he needed to hide from the press and and from admirers. Um, and he had he insisted on going back in as a private. And the reason he told uh, his friends uh, was that he never wanted to be in a position of responsibility again. Um, so I'm just going to read you just the last page, and and then I'll talk a little bit about what ha what's happened in the Middle East since then. Uh, not much of it good. <laughs> um, so he, rejo he rejoined the, the, uh, the military in 1925. Uh, for the next decade, Lawrence occupied a succession of lowly positions within the Air Corps. For nearly a year, he served as a simple base clerk at a remote RAF base in India. In 1929, he bought a tiny cottage in rural Dorset, Clouds Hill, just a mile from the Bovington camp where he had served in the tank corps, and this became his refuge from a still clamoring public and press. While he continued to write, the bulk of his time was devoted to his decidedly prosaic military duties, with off hours spent riding his beloved bro motorcycle through the English countryside, or voraciously reading at Clouds Hill. Despite the assertion of some biographers that this period in Lawrence's life was also highly productive and interesting, it is hard to escape the image of a sad and reclusive man, his circle of friends and acquaintances steadily dwindling to a mere handful and many of these only maintained by the occasional quick note from Lawrence explaining why he couldn't see them. One who insisted on a face-to-face -face meeting was Faisal Hussein. During a state visit to, to England in 1925, the now King of Iraq and Lawrence attended a luncheon at a politician's estate. It proved a rather awkward gathering with the two old comrades in arms seeming to have little to say to each other and Lawrence discomfited by their host's constant invocation of, quote, the good old days. I've changed, Lawrence wrote. Uh, he, he, Charlotte Shaw, George Bernard Shaw's wife, became kind of a, a, after the war, became sort of a mother confessor to Lawrence, and this was a letter he wrote to Charlotte Shaw. Uh, I've changed, Lawrence wrote Charlotte Shaw, and the Lawrence who used to go about and be friendly and familiar with that sort of people is dead. He's worse than dead. 
He's a stranger I once knew. By early 1935, Lawrence resolved to leave the RAF, even as he dreaded the long and unstructured days that lay ahead of him. His apprehensions proved quite accurate. As he wrote to a friend on May 6th from Clouds Hill, just two months into his retirement, quote, at present the feeling is mere bewilderment. I imagine leaves must feel like this after they have fallen from their tree and until they die. Let's hope that that will not be my continuing state. It would not be. Precisely a week later, on the morning of May 13th, Lawrence rode his motorcycle to Bovington Camp to send a telegram. On his return, just a few hundred yards from Clouds Hill, he swerved to avoid two bicycling boys on a narrow road. Clipping the back tire of one of the bicycles, he lost control of the motorcycle and crashed, striking his head on the asphalt. Suffering from massive brain injuries, Lawrence lingered in a coma for six days before finally dying on May 19, 1935. He was 46. Among the pallbearers at his funeral, uh, I'm going to skip that because we don't know these people. Uh, among those in attendance uh, uh, was Winston Churchill. Um, I'm just going to read, uh, uh, w uh, sorry, one of those who delivered a eulogy at, at, at his funeral was Winston Churchill. Quote, I deem him one of the greatest l beings alive in our time. I do not see his like elsewhere. I fear whatever our need, we shall never see his like again. End quote. It's easy to read in Churchill's last sentence an allusion to the new danger by the, that by 1935 was already building over Europe, the rise of Nazi Germany. If Churchill imagined, however, that a living Lawrence might have played a signal role in meeting that danger, he was surely mistaken. As Lawrence himself had been trying to tell the world for many years, the blue-eyed warrior of the desert had passed from the scene long before, lost to the first great cataclysm of the 20th century. Um, so that's how I end the book. Um, so, um, I, I, I mean, what, what, I, what I wanted to do with the book was basically show, uh, wi without going into all, I mean, it's already 500 pages, <laughs> I, without going into anything that happened after Lawrence died, kind of setting the stage for what we, what we see in the Middle East today. And uh, it's funny, uh, this book came out a, uh, just a little bit over a year ago, and at that time I was saying, and, and getting some criticism for saying this, but that I felt that what we were seeing in the Middle East then, a year ago, um, was the final dis dissolution of the of the borders that were imposed on the region uh, a century ago? Um, a, a year ago, I was saying that Iraq, even then, Iraq was essentially three countries. Libya uh, has, is three countries now, and the the fascinating thing of the the division in both those countries is they largely fall down along the lines that existed under the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans uh, had this vi this uh, very clever system, um, you could call it a progressive system, of giving, giving different uh, uh, ethnic and, and, and religious minorities in their empire t a tremendous degree of autonomy, um, almost, almost self-rule, that as long as they paid their taxes and, and met their, their uh, enlistment quotas for the military, they basically governed themselves. And it was a system that really designed, uh, it, it worked, that it kept people from going to each other's throats because there was the, the, the degree of centralization was really minimal. Um, and this was something that I, I think Lawrence saw with, uh, with the, this, the imperial design of, of the, the complete arbitrariness of, of the borders that were created, uh, the, the complete disregard for, for tribal affiliations and animosities um, was all going to blow up in, in, uh, in the European spaces. And, and we as, uh, we being Americans, as the inheritors in the, in the post-World War II era of the, of the European empires, uh, uh, now it's our problem. <laughs> um, but I think L Lawrence really, really foresaw a, a, a lot of things happening. And people often ask me, uh, uh, you know, if Lawrence came back today, what would he say? And, and th the, the answer I always think is, he would have said, I told you so. Um, <laughs> because he really, he, uh, he saw the disaster, uh, the disaster coming, so. Um, so I, I'll, I guess I'll take questions. I, um, okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah.
No, uh, 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 to the degree he changed the borders. No, I mean, what uh, with with the Cairo conference in 1920, what what happened? What uh, every every country that the British had had tried to take in the, in the Middle East had gone up in flames, and so it was this idea of create of, of the Faisal was put on the on the throne of of Iraq, even though he had no connection to Iraq, and then uh, so you had that uh, his family rule for the next 40, 50 years. It was trying to make the best out of a really b b bad situation, but it was very much a, a band-aid approach. And what wasn't touched by the Cairo conference was the the French possessions, uh, Syria uh, and 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 Lebanon, and those were uh, and Lawrence always felt those were the the ones that were really going to to cause the biggest problems down the road because the, the French were really despised uh, in the region. Um, um, well, I you know. Uh, well, I, I well it's 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 kind of com I mean everything about everything about the history of this region is complicated. The f the French had, is, had this role under the Ottomans that goes back through four hundred years, where they were sort of the protectors of the Christian population of of the Ottoman Empire, and they had these and it was called the capitulation. They had this special status of of, of, of have, uh, like interference within the uh, within the Ottoman Empire, in order to protect. The, the Maronite Christians, the, the the Armenian Christians, and the French had really used this to to uh, as a wedge to to ha have tremendous influence in the Ottoman Empire, but but then the majority population, w it was the idea of now Syria is going to go under French control. They had already they had already the the majority Muslim population saw that the that the French were going to favor th the Christians, which is exactly what happened. So. Yes. Yeah. What did Lawrence want to do um, in, in the region? He he wanted he wanted the initial promise that had been made to King Hussein to be upheld and and for the Arabs to have independence. He was never he was never. Um, I mean, he was a he was a pragmatist and a realist. He n I don't think he ever imagined that there was going to be one unified Arab nation. Um, that in fact, what was probably going to happen was that y you're, you were going to end up with a lot of, of smaller nations, and then maybe you would have. But th the whole sense of Arab consciousness is, is very very deep, and so you would end up with some kind of uh, 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 y this this kind of transnational connection that everyone would have, largely based on trade. But he but he never had this. You know, I mean, at that time in in. Uh, in the Arab world, you had Beirut, which was just as cosmopolitan and worldly as, as, as Paris or London. And then 500 miles away, not even 500 miles away, in, in the Arabian Peninsula, you still had slave, uh, Faisal had slaves. Um, and, you know, and, and I mean, <laughs> I forget about talking about women's rights or anything. Um, so, so, you know, the, I, the notion that, y that this, the, this was like one people that would fit into one nation was, I, I, don't, I don't think he ever really uh, believed that. The, but the difficult thing in trying to figure out what Lor what Lawrence believed or what he wanted was that he was such a tactician. So in different letters, he would say very different things. So if he was writing to say you know a British neo imperialist, he would he would kind of angle it. He would angle his proposal of of why independence was still good for the British Empire. Um, where with somebody who was a real progressive, he would he would be much more overt and and. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'm. I, I'm not. Sh I, I, I'm not sure he really had such a clear idea of what should be there. He just knew that what was going in there was going to be a fiasco. Yeah. Was it, was it really an accident? <laughs> 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 question is, was it was Lawrence really in an accident? Or was he was he knocked off by British intelligence? Um, <laughs> I think it was an accident. Because first, first of all, he 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 loved speeding on his motorcycle, and this was before helmets. Um, but also, there was no real reason. I, you know, I mean, there are these conspiracy theories that 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 the, the British killed Lawrence. Um, there was no, you know, he was done. He was he was just this sad guy, um, and I, it's hard to it's hard to imagine what the point would have been. I, I mean, if they if they had done that, they should have done it in 1919. I mean, that's when they really would likely have killed him. So. <laughs>
Yes. Uh, well, his personal life is, is uh, it's, well, either, it, I mean, it's rather non-existent, actually. Um, uh, most people think he was probably uh, severely repressed gay. I mean, re repressed to the point that, that maybe he never acted on it. Um, he was certainly never linked to a woman, ever. Um, uh, my own feeling is that, that, that he probably was um, uh, a, a severely repressed homosexual. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, Gertrude Bell, and, and uh, Gertrude Bell was, uh, she, uh, she was fascinating. She was the highest ranking, uh, she was the only, <laughs> I think, uh, woman uh, diplomat in the, in the British Foreign Service at that time. And she had gone out to Iraq uh, as a young woman in her 20s and had, and had really become kind of an expert on, on uh, Iraq and on the tribes in Iraq. And had also gone out into the desert and mapped large parts of the Eastern Arabian Peninsula. Uh, she and Lawrence met before the war. They met at the, at the archaeological site in, in uh, Syria. Um, but during the war, she was, uh, she was almost exclusively in Iraq. She was in Basra. And almost all the fighting was, certainly the fighting that, that I write about was, on the, uh, was in Syria, uh, so on the western side. Um, so they had very little connection with each other during the war, and then sh and then Gertrude Bell played a, a really important role in the Cairo conflicts with with Lawrence and Churchill in 1920, uh, and then um, ended up I, I, I mean uh, dying in mysterious circumstances a few years a few years after that, and, and most people think she committed suicide, but that it was uh, she had she had this man she was really in love with, but it was this uh, as I recall he was married and th they could never be together, and then finally it ended. Shortly, shortly after she died, and and she probably did commit suicide. But in the, in the, in the mores of the day, her suicide was hushed up, and it turned into uh, you know dysentery or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, implications f of, of from Lawrence. Oh, my m oh, oh, my thoughts. <laughs> um, you know, I think I think things have gotten uh, so bad so quickly that I don't uh, I don't think that I don't think we have a policy now in the Middle East. I think we're we're on a we're just we're purely reactive to the next you know whatever whatever disaster happens next. And I'm not sure, I, at, at this point, I'm not sure what having a policy would even look like. Because, um, you know, people say, oh, you know, in, in Syria, we should have, we should have, um, we should have started arming and, and equipping and, and advising the, the, the moderate Syrian rebels, you know, three years ago. But what also happens, and, and this is, has always been true in, in the, certainly for the last 20, 30 years, is as soon as the Americans attach I mean, it's a kiss of death <laughs> if you're a rebel to have the Americans embrace you. You know, it, it, so how do you even go about? How do the Americans even go about assisting people in the region when when th that instantly uh, delegitimizes you in the eyes of a lot of the world? I I, I, m I mean, my feeling is that uh, my personal feeling is that that uh, what th the the administration really needs to do is really lean on uh, the regional powers. Uh, and especially Saudi Arabia, who are, uh, uh, have had a big role in causing this whole, I mean, if you're talking about Islamic State, um, who had a big role in, in, s in fostering this in the first place. Um, and I, it, means, it means making a rapprochement with Iran. Um, I think that Iran needs to be a part of the solution in the, in the region. Um, people always talk about Turkey, but it's actually quite limited what Turkey can do because they were the imperial masters of the Arab world. So. You know, I remember at one point people talking about, well, you know, have the have the Turks come into northern Syria and and uh, you know and create a safe safe zone. And, and you know, this is exactly what Bashar al-Assad, the, the dictator of Syria, would love. Uh, there's nothing would please him more than have the Turks come across his border because they're 
and so they remind people of that whole history of, of 500 years of Turkish domination. Um, so I, 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 I don't know really what what kind of policy there can be in the region, um, except really lean on the regional powers to, to step up and, and assume a kind of a leadership role, because I don't think the Americans can, and I don't think the Europeans can now either. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 it, it, it is. I, I, I mean, with with ISIS, you're just seeing something I, as I don't know you've ever really seen ever, bef you know, before anywhere in the world. And I mean, it's just such a nihilistic kind of a, a doomsday group. Um, You know, th th uh, this is this is kind of a tangent, but uh, you know, the whole Ebola crisis, which is just a, it's about to get so much worse. Talk it, it when you talk about this, 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 you know, transmigration of people and stuff across borders, it's really going to be interesting what happens with Ebola because I th this is go about to become such a massive international crisis, and that they are going to start quarantining na whole nations. I mean, probably within the next week or so. Um, that I, it'll be interesting what if they if they figure out some sort of system going forward from that of of in political or, or military situations that that if it, it, that apply um, it's kind of a roundabout way to answer your question I mean to not answer your question but <laughs> yes Uh, yes, the, the 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 population of the Ottoman Empire uh, at the outbreak of World War II was about 20 million, not not including Egypt, because the British had already seized Egypt. Um, but you're talking about Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Arabian Peninsula, and then the uh, little bit of south, you know, the little s southeastern tip of, of Europe. Uh, b but about about 20 million all told in that. And today, those same countries is probably. 350 million? No, I, I think it's that I think that that's absolutely true. Yeah, I mean, the, it, I was stunned when I, I, I had no idea that that in you know a hundred years ago the population of that region was only twenty million. I, I was I would have I would have just thought uh, 80, 90 million. Um, yeah, it's just an absolute explosion. You mentioned Egypt. I, I actually spent a lot of time in Egypt. Um, I, I did a piece about two years before the revolt there, and it, it was called um, Under the Volcano. <laughs> In Egypt, because I felt that it, the place was about to explode, and and it and it was very much for that reason that you have these, you know, tens of millions of young people. I mean, average age in Egypt, I don't, uh, I, I I'm guessing, but I, I'll say 24 is is, is the average age. Um, so these tens of millions of young people with no jobs or or just complete dead end jobs, really no future. So this is this kind of this seething uh, resentment that just builds and builds, um, and uh, yeah, and, and I think it, the outlet has to go somewhere. So, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Lord. Lowell Thomas, uh, the question is, is uh, Lowell Thomas, who was uh, uh, Lawrence's, uh, really put Lawrence on the map. He, uh, uh, Lowell Thomas was an American journalist slash huckster who, <laughs> who uh, spent, uh, hap uh, d d came across Lawrence in the, in the desert, um, realized it was a good story, 
then sh so at the same time that at, at, at the Paris Peace Conference, <coughs> uh, Lowell Thomas had put on this um, uh, kind of lecture show in London about Lawrence. It, it actually, it, it started out as w about Allenby, with, with Allenby in Jerusalem and Lawrence in Arabia. And he, and uh, Lowell Thomas very quickly figured out no one really cared about Allenby. That, that it was, they cared about Lawrence, so it became uh, with Lawrence in Arabia. Um, but most of, most of what Lowell Thomas said was uh, he spent all told I think about four days with with Lawrence in in Arabia, so most of it was all uh, was fiction. Um, but this this uh, lecture show he did became this international sensation, and uh, over over a million uh, Brits saw the show, including the King and Queen of, of England, um, and it's it's really what what propelled Lawrence at first to, to become this, this, uh, this inter international celebrity. Um, and I, 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 I you can kind of understand why, you know, it's, I mean, the, at least the f fanciful image of the war in the desert, and here's this, this, this you know, blue-eyed Oxford scholar wearing robes and, you know, attacking camels and everything. And you stack that against the uh, war on the Western Front, where you, you, you absolutely cannot romanticize that conflict in any way. Um, so I, I think for you know people who had and you had a whole generation that was just devastated in that war and to, and to to try to find some meaning to some some you know little hint of romanticism about that conflict, Lawrence was kind of it, um, at least for a British audience. So, and and yeah, and Lowell Thomas <laughs> played it played it to the hilt. <laughs> yes. Saudi Arabia. Right. No. Okay. Well, thank you. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I probably, I probably only agree with Tom Friedman about half the time, but with the, I guess about that's what we do. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I said, I said, are there any Armenian traditions that are not preserved in libraries and or collections of biographies and pamphlets and, and history or mysteries that they haven't entered into the field yet? You, do you mean comparing that to the, the yeah. situation today? Uh, I don't know how I don't know how well you can compare it to the, the situation today with the rise of Nazi Germany because I, I, you, I think you just had. I mean, you have the same streak in, in American people. It's all always tends to to push towards isolation anyway, to to sort of to kind of uh, g going inward. Um, but I think there was an, I, I think that there was a lot more complicated um, decisions being made about Nazi Germany. For one being, you had, and to a much larger, much more uh, significant degree today, you, uh, with ethnic identity in this country, the German American. There were a lot of German Americans who took. You know who would have been very upset with with uh, Congress if they had if they had moved against uh, uh, seeming to seeming to move against like German you know German interests. Um, yeah, I, I I mean I just I'm not I'm not sure how to compare the two the two situations. I mean we are, we have been engaged in in the region for a long time and and it just seems. I mean, I think I think part of wha what it is 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 that y everything we have done has made things worse, or has, has certainly not made things better. So, at what at, at a certain point, okay, okay, there's certain things you can do. You can arm the Kurds as a, as a, as a proxy. I, the Kurds can the, the Iraqi Kurds can't ever come out and declare their independence, but they're in fact a de facto uh, nation now. So you funnel weapons to them. You 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 get rid of Maliki in in Iraq, who was a huge part of the problem. Um, but beyond that, there's, I just, I think that there's this general recognition, and I think it's on both political parties, there's a general recognition that it's very limited what you can do. Yes, yes ma'am, yeah. <laughs> Right. 
Right. No, it, um, no, you're not. But what? Yeah. What? I mean, what? Ha the, why? Why the Arabs were uh, wanted to rebel against the Turks? What had happened is right uh, it, uh, under the Sultans uh, in the Ottoman Empire, the, the, there had been this whole system um, of of. Uh, of, of tremendous autonomy for different regions. But when the young Turks came into power, which was in uh, 1912, uh, they had much more of this idea of, of, of centralizing the empire. And also, a lot of them were, were a kind of Turkish chauvinists. They, they, there was this whole idea of, of the rebirth of, of Turkic identity. And so if it, and most of the leadership was, were ethnic Turks. So very quickly, the, the, the minorities and the Arabs it saw this. Uh, they saw this as this Turkish-centric uh, empire that they were now a, a part of. You know, and, and I mean, despite their kind of you know progressive and, and uh, ideas, the Ottomans. I mean, it, you know, there was still an empire, and they were still quite vicious <laughs> in their in their own way. So I think there was a lot of. And you know, you're this is the era. This is the explosion of nationalism. All you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, all across Europe. Um, and so, you know, some of that, at least among the, the kind of more educated classes in the in the Arab world, the the idea of an Arab national identity was taking hold. Yeah. yeah. I I think uh, what, what did Churchill and Lawrence have in common? I I think. I think Lawrence really sort of saved Churchill's butt uh, at, at the Cairo conference. Um, uh, yeah, I mean Churchill. Churchill was a, absolutely a, yeah an un, un, unreconstructed imperialist, but but things had gotten so bad so quickly um, right after the the, the 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 imperial division of the region that I think Churchill saw that the whole thing was uh, Iraq. Iraq went up in flames, and uh, it's funny. Uh, in 1920, uh, Lawrence wrote this op-ed for the Sunday Times saying, if we don't mend our ways in Iraq, you're going to see civil war there in March of next year. <laughs> and the civil war actually came in May. He was off by two months. But none of no one else saw it coming. And, and, and Lawrence didn't even know Iraq that well. So what they s and a thousand British soldiers were, were killed in, in um, I don't know, about a week and a half because they, they didn't see it coming, so they were slaughtered. Um, and Churchill had been a part of that of that this idea of expanding the the British Empire. So, um, I I think that he, they that Churchill saw this whole thing could just could just blow up, and it's like let's save what we can from it. And and he managed to enlist Lawrence into helping him do that. And so I think he felt I, th I think he felt a, a, a you know great sense of gratitude to Lawrence for that. Yeah, yeah two more. Uh, I guess. Yeah, there's. Uh, I think Lowell Thomas's papers are at the University of Texas in Austin. Oh no, you know it's no. I don't think there's. It was ever film. I don't think it was ever filmed all, all the way through. Yeah, I think there's a script somewhere. I think, and it's pr it's probably at the. It's called the Ransom Center at at, at University of Texas in Austin. Yeah, they had dancing girls and palm trees and camels. It, it was really. It's. Uh, I've seen posters of it, and it's. It, it, yeah. Yeah. They. They look like harem. Uh, yeah. These really buxom wi women in in kind of scantily clad clothes. And it's. Yeah. It's very funny. But, uh, yes. The, yeah. My thoughts on the future of Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah. Um, You know, uh, I, I, have, I have to say one thing I, about that whole region of the world. I kind of feel like, and I kind of felt true until until uh, ISIS came along. I just feel like, I mean, nothing ever, is never the best case scenario ever happens, but usually not the worst case scenario either. Uh, until ISIS came along, and there's certainly, the, uh, to my mind, the, w the worst case scenario. Um, I think two things about Afghanistan. I think that that Americans are going to um, 
yeah, we're looking for the decent interval, that, that great cynical quote from Kissinger about Vietnam. You know, we're, we're looking for the decent interval of when we can kind of say we've done everything we set out to do and, and kind of mission accomplished and get out uh, before the whole thing goes, goes down the tubes. Um, and I, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of in the cards. Although I think Afghanistan is, there are so many regional, regional players there and, and regional uh, bosses and, and ethnic bosses that it, it, I don't know if the Taliban's gonna completely, t I don't think it's gonna be a return to, to you know, pre-September 11th, 2001. Um, you could end up with kind of a patchwork of, of, of uh, kind of mini nations divided up along ethnic groups. But as far as like for the, Amer you know, for the American mission, I mean, my feeling is it's, it's, we're, it's done. Uh, I mean, the same way as in Iraq, um, that it's, it's just, you know, declare victory and get the hell out. <laughs> um, that is my, f my feeling. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And please, if you'd like, purchase the book and have Scott sign it for you. And watch our website for many more great programs to come in the future. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>